I got 99 problems, but a glitch ain't one. OpenAI introduces the SWE Lancer, a benchmark of over 1,400 freelance software engineering tasks from Upwork, real-world software engineering tasks, which are valued at one million US dollars in real-world payouts. If I had a million bucks, it wouldn't be enough because I'd still be writing clever hacks. This encompasses both independent engineering tasks, ranging from $50 bug fixes to 32,000 feature implementations, as well as managerial tasks where models choose between technical implementation proposals. OpenAI thinks that by mapping model performance to actual monetary value, they hope that SWE Lancer enables greater research into the economic impact of AI model development. I got pennies for my thoughts. Now I'm rich. OpenAI drops SWE Lancer. Can Frontier LLMs earn $1 million from real-world freelance software engineering? One thing that constantly comes up is this idea of how large language models and various other AI tools, how they are going to impact software development, how they are going to impact the future of coding. Is it going to be used to sort of replace those high salary positions and replace them with AI tools? And this paper, I think, kind of makes that big leap from talking about, you know, benchmarks and scores to real world payments, to real world currency, to actually getting paid for completing tasks, right? Work, employment. Here's from their little announcement of this thing. And this is an important point to understand. So they're saying by mapping model performance to monetary value, we hope that SWE Lancer enables greater research into the economic impact of AI model development. But I think it's important to kind of keep this in mind. So the first reasoning model that OpenAI had was the millionth best coder in the world. I, I would guess they probably had it somewhere around the end of 2023. Then I believe the 01 in September 2024, that was around the 10,000th best coder in the world. Then this year, right, 03, January 2025, the 03 is ranked as the 175th best coder in the world according to Code Forces. So again, this is the 03 right there. Sam in this interview in Japan shared with us that they do have an internal model that's the 50th best coder in the world. And he's kind of guessing that we might have something in you know, the top in 2025. You know, again, we're talking about it. benchmarks, not necessarily how that's translating into real world tasks, but we're kind of like approaching that time where it's slowly going to be transitioning into like, what can you actually do in the real world? And so what you're seeing that more and more, you know, Sam Altman is one of the people talking about this, but he's certainly not the only one. They're beginning to talk more and more in terms of monetary impact, job loss, what percentage of the workforce can this potentially automate, make redundant? So let's take a look at this SWE, software engineering. I'll just say SWE because it's easier to say and kind of fun to say too. So they introduce a SWE Lancer, a benchmark that contains over 1400 freelance software engineering tasks from Upwork. But as you can see here, so they've selected the various software engineering tasks that are valued, you know, in aggregate altogether at 1 million US in real world payout. So this is the, the salary that you would be getting paid if you completed all those tasks. And SWE Lancer encompasses both independent engineering tasks, ranging from a very simple, you know, $50 bug fixes to $32,000 feature implementations, as well as managerial tasks where models choose between technical implementation proposals. And of course, they, they, they find that, you know, the frontier models are still not able to solve the majority of tasks, but they do provide an open source sort of like ability for everybody to test their agents on it to help with future research so that everybody can kind of have visibility in this and test their agents on it. And we can see how this field is progressing. All right. So again, they split it up into sort of two groups of tasks. We have the, you know, they're going to call it the IC, individual contributor, right? So this is where models generate code patches to resolve real world issues, right? So the, the end sort of the deliverable is some code that satisfies the requirements. And there's the SWE manager tasks where models act as a sort of technical leads by selecting the best implementation proposal for a, a given problem. All right. So what are the actual things that we're doing to kind of test these models out to see how well they're able to code. Here's an example of that kind of independent contractor task. So as you can see up here, so the original issue, so again, so this is like one of the little modules within this benchmark, one of the little test samples, right? Test problems. And we have the, the problem, the description, and the price. So here we have an $8,000 sort of issue and the zip slash postcode validation error message not displayed for entering comma on the home address screen. So what they do is they take the, the code base and and they reverted to just right before the fix was implemented, right? So with a lot of software development,
development, you kind of have a version control. So different sort of checkpoints or save files. So you're basically able to like go back in time and restore everything to right before it was fixed. So a human being came in, right, found the solution, fixed the problem. But right before that, we have a checkpoint. So now we're reverting to that checkpoint and we're telling this model, okay, now you try fixing it. So the model is prompted with a task and asked to produce a patch that resolves the issue. So in this example, it just adds a zip code validation utility. Human software engineers create end-to-end -end tests for the issues, right? Then we have the score and evaluate. So the greater human generated end-to-end -end tests are run against the model's updated code base and the scoring. So if the end-to-end -end test is passed, the model fix is successful, which translates to earned payout. So ka-ching, $2,000 earned or $0 earned if it's not successful. And then so the other sort of side of the problem, the other type of problems that it solves is the SWE manager tasks, right? So the original issue, this is, has a bounty of $250 or, or a payout rather. And a reason appears bolded briefly after holding the request. And then you have the various proposals on how to approach fixing this, right? So this is submitted by various users. And so the AI model is prompted with a task and told its objective is to choose the proposal that best resolves the issue. It chooses proposal number four because, and it gives a reasoning, it looks like so it provides provides a focused quick fix for the bold styling issue without unnecessary dependencies. And for this one, if you recall, we're just trying to compare it to what the sort of the experienced human manager would do in that situation. So compare the LM's choice of solution with the ultimately implemented solution. And if the model chooses the same thing, then it earns a thousand dollars. Why I think this is such an interesting benchmark because the, the payout that's associated with each task, each task has an associated payment with it. It's not an estimate, right? It's the actual amount paid to the freelancer who completed it. And to those amounts, they're, they're not trivial, right? So 35% of tasks are worth more than a thousand. 34% of the tasks are 500 to a thousand. So as an example of like the task selection, right? So they've used Expensify, which is a 300 million USD public company that's traded on NASDAQ with 12 million users who rely on software, meaning that it's, it's commercially valuable software engineering tasks. The open source Expensify repository posts tasks on Upwork for freelance engineers with concrete payouts. Now, the reason I point this out is because, um, you know, obviously the prices that people pay for this stuff, you know, how do you determine kind of like what's the actual price that the different tasks are worth? It's a dynamically priced based on real world difficulty. So again, that Expensify, so it's an open source repository, right? So they, they post their issues. So that remember that little zip code issue that we were having that the model solved by adding that little test to make sure that um, everything's working correctly. So this thing where it adds a zip code validation utility. So when I saw the price, I was like $8,000. That seems uh, that seems like a lot. I was a little bit surprised to see that amount of being paid for what seemed at first glance. I mean, you don't know what's happening sort of behind the scenes, but at first glance, that seems like a lot of money for that fix. Well, how they arrived at that number is... So the week one, you know, when they first posted, they're like, ah, we'll pay a thousand dollars to whomever can solve this issue. Whenever they're not able to solve it within that week, they increase how much they're willing to, to pay for it. So $2,000, it was increased to $2,000. There were five proposals that were rejected for failing to solve the issue, right? So you, you might have had an experience like that, where at first you glance at something like, all right, this, this should be pretty easy. Let's, let's knock it down one week. Let's pay a little bit of money. If you've ever seen those like home restoration remodeling shows, right? They're like, oh, how much is it going to cost to like knock down this wall in the bathroom and add a mirror? They're like, oh, it's just going to be a thousand dollars right then you see him going out of the hammers right like knocking down the wall they're like oh you have mold that will be two hundred fifty thousand dollars now please and you see like the couple crying they're like we don't have that kind of money it never makes sense to me what those people like their careers are right because they're like one is a stay-at-home stay mom and one is like a middle school teacher and they're like we're buying this 10 million dollar home it's like how like who are these people you know anyways but week four they double the price to four thousand complexity of issue becomes apparent so the independent contractors search for a solution that validates across all global postal codes right because if you remember recall the solution had like whatever eight to ten lines where it checks every country's postal code and finally like all right eight thousand dollars after further iteration on the last proposal with the SWE manager the bounty doubles and the fix is made so this seems like a really good way to price these problems because we're posting to the entire world of, of people that work on this stuff we're like we'll pay you a thousand dollars to do it right if no if the, the world is not able to to solve that a thousand we do two thousand then four thousand then eight thousand then if right, the, the global marketplace is able to come up with somebody who is able to and willing to, to solve that for $8,000, then that would be like an accurate sort of uh, price for that specific request. Let me know in the comments if you disagree. But this seems like a pretty good way of how to value these tasks. But okay, take a guess at what these models were doing. Let's say the 01, the Sonnet, and the 40, right? So from earning $0 and just failing at uh, doing this to earning $1 million. Like, where are we in this process right now, right? Is it, is, it, is it here? Is it almost at a million, right? That would be kind of scary. Where do you think these models kind of uh, fall? 
for me, I, I was going to guess like somewhere like 10%. So that's like a hundred thousand, so somewhere in this range. I was kind of surprised. It's definitely higher than where I thought it would be. So here it is, GPT-40, the O1, and Cloud 3.5 Sonnet. Sonnet is, of course, a lot of people love it. A lot of people are, are saying this is this is the best model. I think that was the first model that maybe like sit up and take notice of like, whoa, like it's getting pretty good at coding. And so, of course, um, you know, 400,000 out of a million, right? So, so 40% out of the total tasks that um, it could complete to, to earn money, it did, right? 40%, 400,000 out of 1 million. That seems scary, doesn't it? That seems like a lot higher than I would have guessed at this point in time, right? Then the O1 at 380, so you can say 38%, and then a GPT-40, 300, so 30%. The other thing to keep in mind here is so Cloud 3.5 is, you know, if we're looking at something like SWE verified, right? So encoding, it's one of the better models on those benchmarks, but there's a lot of ones like the O3 Mini High, the O1, I mean, they're up there as well, right? So as you can see here, Cloud 3.5 is at 50.8, but we, we've got some close contenders. We have a DeepSeek R1, OpenAI O1, OpenAI 3 Mini High. I mean, they're all with just a few tenths of a uh, percent of each other. They're, they're pretty close, but can you spot the problem? The problem is Cloud 3.5 Sonnet. It's not the best, right? So there is the best one. It's this one right here, OpenAI 03, and OpenAI 03 sits at 71.7. Now it's unreleased, and so, you know, we can't, like, confirm it. And also, we don't know if that directly, you know, sort of translates into it being as good on, uh, you know, the other sort of the, like the real world tasks, but it's it's 42% better than Cloud 3.5. So that means that here, it would put it at 572,000 something something dollars. That's the mythical 03 model yet unreleased. And in fact, I, I feel like Sam Allen said that it's, it's probably not going to get released if they're going to go to kind of a unified model, but this will be sort of one of the models in there. And again, he also referred to there being an internal model at OpenAI that is even kind of like next level. So it does seem like we're like a lot further into this thing than I would have guessed, right? We're a lot closer to that million dollar mark than I would have guessed. And of course, if you recall, they do break down kind of like the prices that are paid for various tasks into their own sort of task ranges. And so we're strictly using the O1 here at low reasoning effort, medium reasoning effort, and high reasoning effort. So what this means is like how much sort of resources do we spend on letting it think, how much compute, right? So how many tokens it's able to burn through thinking before coming up with the final solution. And the reason that's important is because we're able to get sort of better and better and better answers and accuracy at an exponentially higher cost in terms of compute and of course that translates into how much money we're paying for for computer for the api cost if, if we're paying somebody else to run that model and if you recall that arc agi like the prize in the competition they sort of illustrate the cost per task here so how much are we paying in compute to answer each one of the questions and also versus what the score was out of 100 percent on the arc agi so they posted the o1 low o1 medium and o1 high right so the low reasoning one got 25 percent the human baseline was like 80 something or 80 or 85, I believe, something like that. Right, so kind of keep these numbers in mind because that's what we're seeing illustrated in this paper. Right, again, the O1 low, O1 medium, O1 high. But you see kind of like the jump in accuracy as we increase the amount of compute that we allow to, to, to use to think that gets it better results. But now look at the massive jump to O3 low, low meaning low compute, right? So we take the low, the O3 low, and we don't give it too much compute because for the ArcGI prize, there's a limit on how much compute you can use. $10,000 for the entire set of questions, I think was the, the maximum that you can use. And if I recall correctly, so the O3 low used something like two or 3,000, something like that. So it was well within that sort of budget. But notice that, that huge jump, right? From O1 low to O3 low. Also, what we found is if we exponentially increase the amount of compute, right? We can go from 76% to O3 high hitting 88%. So and somewhere between these two lines is kind of like the human baseline, right? So O3 low is less than humans and O3 high beats us by some number of points. Now we try to calculate how much they spent on this compute. I think it was like 300,000 plus, right? So they really cranked it up, or at least that was like the retail cost. It's how much you and I would pay to to run that model uh, for that much. Uh, for opening it's probably cheaper to run it, right? But it, like the, the, the jump in cost was massive, but as you can see, that does produce better answers, more accurate answers, right? But keep keep this in 
mind as we look at this chart with with the accuracy on the money related tasks what we're looking at there is is these three how well did these three do right we're not talking about these right and here we have um the 01 so under 500 i mean there's really no sort of clear pattern 2000 plus also not a clear pattern but for these it seems pretty obvious that the more compute you use the better the model gets the accuracy improves as they note here higher reasoning effort improves overall pass at one so kind of getting the right answer on the first attempt and improves performance on harder more expensive tasks and certainly you can see that here letting it think more spending more money on compute obviously has a, a strong impact on how well it's able to complete those tasks one interesting thing here in the future of work uh they're mentioning that an interesting immediate exploration will be comparing freelancer payouts to api costs for completing tasks that that that's rough right so i'm i'm reading that as you know if you've spent one hundred thousand dollars for example on employing these freelancers right to complete various tasks for you how much would that cost in api costs to replace them with these models you know assuming the models are able to do all of that work i mean those numbers are going to be kind of scary to look at uh, because i don't know how much would that translate to in terms of like api cost to run these models i mean maybe it would be thousands of dollars right i'm just making this up i don't really have any data i'm just totally guessing let me know by the way if there's a better way to kind of approximate what that number would be but then of course if you're talking about uh open source models i mean i feel like that's where it gets kind of even scarier because that might be you know 200 bucks I, I don't know i mean i feel like at that point that's just the cost of electricity if you're running it locally let me know if i'm thinking about that correctly but man that seems kind of crazy to think about if you have a highly capable open source model that you're able to run it locally and you're able to sort of like allocate certain compute resources for it to you know high compute to to think about certain problems longer you know if you have a task like that eight thousand dollar task the bug fix how much would that cost you to to generate the solution for assuming you have a good enough model to be able to generate that solution i mean i mean i don't know we're, we're talking about like less than uh, going through the starbucks to drive through I'm, I'm i'm thinking right so let me know what you think about that i think it's a great benchmark and it's very interesting that we're beginning to kind of like measure the progress of ai and actual real sort of economic impact real sort of monetary impact how much money you can make that real human beings freelancers are from across the world are making on these real tasks it to me seems like a very well very very smartly designed benchmarks you know if you could spot something wrong with with the methodology and how it's uh how it's set up to measure these things definitely let me know in the comments i'd be curious to know um if there's any sort of like areas for improvement put those in the comments so the question is i guess do you think that this benchmark that we just looked at is it a good representation on sort of the economic impact that these new coding models will have on the software engineering field and are you surprised by this that we're sitting at about 40 percent of the tasks completed that kind of seems ahead of schedule to me maybe a little bit and maybe that was kind of like the point of this benchmark is because opening i sam Alman has been talking about this kind of the economic impact dario amade a lot a lot more people are talking about the potential upcoming sort of financial economic impact of these models you know i've i've often said sort of on this channel like you know don't panic everything's good does this seem like you know maybe not not time to panic but does this seem concerning right because it's like getting good scores on an exam is one thing this is kind of like putting it into a, a very different light right because not that long ago right so humans did 100 percent of this work and nothing else could now already right it's only you know call it 60 percent that only humans could do and by all accounts there's another unreleased model that cuts that down to what 43 percent and potentially some internal models that cut it down further that seems like a very rapid sort of like progress and automation that's like directly impacting work let me know in the comments what you think if you don't think that this is going to sort of contribute to actual software engineers coders across the world losing some percentage of, of jobs being lost in that field if you don't think that these models will affect it then i'd love for you to be able to explain like what metric are we missing is there some benchmark that these models can't do at all that, that 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 only humans can do for which we're not seeing any progress in other words is there some test that shows that in some aspect of software engineering these models are not making any forward progress is there some benchmark that kind of shows a different numbers or, or tells a different story perhaps with all that said um i just want to applaud openai for publishing papers like this they're phenomenal open sourcing uh, these benchmarks putting in tons of work it seems like to to create these tests also keep in mind that these tests these met metrics these benchmarks uh, this is what they're gonna use later to you know pummel 
pummel their opponents into submission, right? Because eventually we're going to see the results on this test for, for example, Grok 3, right? The, the reasoning Grok 3 model, you know, where we're going to see what number of tasks, for example, the R1 can perform. I'm sure at some point they'll get the best Google model and uh, test it here as well, right? And then once everybody's on the board, they're going to, of course, drop the O3 model or whatever the next sort of thing that they're releasing just to sort of uh, be on the top of that once again. So that's very exciting, but also, um, I don't know, maybe a little bit concerning in terms of like how quickly this progress is happening. Let me know what you think if you made it this far. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Wes Roth and I'll see you next time.